socks like Achilles in his tent. <laughs> Achilles? It's the Iliad? Dun, 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 dun. It's Homer! Read a book! Limbus Company is the third game project of the studio Project Moon, currently in development. After making a management sim and a deck building game, the studio decided that the next title they develop should be a dungeon crawler and a city builder as a fourth test project because why typecast yourself to a single genre when you can do all of them? I love you Project Moon, please never stop. Limbus has been teased for some time now with the reveals of the 12 core characters. And as I said in my Library of Ruina video, the game studio is stuffed by a bunch of fine arts nerds. So of course, every character is a reference to a work of literature. Initially, the characters were drip-fed on the Twitter account at LiberarLimbus, which translates to Free the Limbo, basically. First it was a portrait with the eyes covered, then an emoji, and then a quote from the novel in its author's native language. I would like to apologize in advance to every language I'm about to butcher. With all 12 characters fully and properly revealed, let's dissect the references one by one. In the order, the full art was posted on the Twitter account. Though, let me temper your expectations a bit, I'm terrible at actually reading books and some of these are outside of my cultural circles, so a lot of this information is brought up from external sources. Metamorphosa ungehuren ungezifa, transformed into monstrous vermin. Gregor is a reference to Gregor Samsa, the protagonist of Metamorphosis, a novella written by Franz Kafka in 1915. Gregor is a traveling cloth merchant working his butt off as the sole breadwinner of his household, which includes his parents and a younger sister. One day, he wakes up turned into a monstrous vermin. His own body doesn't feel right, he cannot get up from bed properly, no food or drink seems as it was before. At first, his sister volunteers to take care of him, but that relationship quickly grows cold as it becomes more and more obvious that this transformation is not temporary and communicating with Roach Gregor is difficult, to say the least. You might want to give Metamorphosis a try if you struggle with depression or any other illness that might lead to feelings of alienation is what I'm saying. Limbus Gregor has a roach arm and is surrounded by cockroaches, so the theming is quite overt. His ego, I assume, is called Ungezifa, which means vermin in German. Kafka was Bohemian by birth, which is currently the Czech territory, but as that was a territory of Austria-Hungary at the time, he wrote in German. However, Kafka was also Jewish, which is why one word of the quote and Gregor's name are written in Hebrew. And the word Ungezifer, specifically, was used to describe Jewish people by a certain political party that rose to power some years after Kafka's death? Putting the two languages together here seems very deliberate. On by Hacheł sowsem zabycia, sio zabyć, patą pranuncja i na ciat sowsem syznowa. He longed to forget himself altogether, to forget everything, and then to wake up and begin life anew. Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov is an impoverished student in St. Petersburg and the protagonist of the novel Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, first published in 1866. Despite his poor stature, Rodion views himself as a pure to Napoleon, a remorseless overman, one destined for such greatness that he is not bound by conventional morality that dictates the right and wrong of common folk. One day, both to test himself and to elevate himself out of poverty, he takes up an axe with the intent to murder an old, widely despised moneylender. As the blade of the hatchet ends not just the life of the usurer, but also that of her completely innocent pregnant sister, Rodion very quickly finds out that he is very much capable of remorse. The character art prominently displays gambling, which is a great visual representation both of delusions of grandeur and promises of wealth. And, just like with murder, it's ill-gotten wealth that nonetheless allures people like Rodion with promises of status that would be otherwise unachievable. Her ego is called Raskol, a reference to the last name of the novel's protagonist. In translation, it means to split, which is exactly what an axe does to anything that meets its blade. Ich wollte ja nichts als das zu leben versuchen, was von selber aus mir heraus wollte. 
Varun Vardas Zosea Ashvea. I wanted only to live in accord with the promptings which came from my true self. Why was that so difficult? Demian, the story of Emil Sinclair's youth, is a novel by Hermann Hesse, first published in 1919. At first, the book was published as being authored by the titular Emil Sinclair, who also serves as the narrator of the story. Emil's entire existence is that of a struggle between the physical world, described as Scheinwelt, which can mean either world of light or world of illusions, and the realm of platonic ideals. It's very much a story of a man trying to climb out of Plato's cave and the duality between light of ideals and the shadows it casts in the physical world are clearly represented in the character's art. His ego is called Vogel, which means bird in German. A bird breaking out of its own eggshell is a theme present in the story. The bird, representing a person, must first break out of its shell, the world, to truly be born and be able to fly towards the sky and closer to God or truth that encompasses everything. The novel mentions the Gnostic deity Abraxas as being that presides over all, the good and bad, the true and illusory. Bonus points for the fact that this metaphor was stolen wholesale by Utena. Go watch Utena. Have you ever seen a stuffed genius? Yi Sang is the name of a real Korean poet and writer, but the choice of emoji and quote point towards his 1936 short story Wings, in which the narrator is only ever referred to as I. I'll be honest, this one gave me the most issues. The summaries are short and nonsensical, and the author is renowned for his surrealist stream of consciousness style. So, of course, I located an English translation of the story and read it whole. It's like 12 pages, it's way less of a deal than I made it sound. In short, it's a story of a man so disassociated that he neither feels happy nor unhappy, lounging around in his sunless room for days. He doesn't know what his wife does all day, but she feeds him and gives him money, even if he does not enjoy the food and has nothing to spend the money on. But over time, he grows curious. He goes out, he wants to know why his wife keeps having male guests in her room that give her money. He wishes to have someone to give that money to. As he stumbles from heavy rain into his house, he sees what he should not have seen, hint hint, and his wife feeds him sleeping pills under the guise of trying to cure him from the cold. At the end, the man finds himself on the rooftop, wanting to shout that he wants his wings, his ambitions and dreams that he used to have back, but the words are never uttered. Hell, the entire story doesn't have one bit of dialogue, it's all tone of voice and summary. Now, I have to admit I feel I missed a lot from this story, both in translation and due to lack of cultural context. Could it be just a story about a man so depressed he never left his room as his wife turned to sex work to feed both of them? Maybe. But considering that I mentions being 26, the same age as Didi Sang when the story was written, that Korea has been under Japanese occupation all his life, that he suffered from pneumonia that claimed his life a year later, and that Japanese authorities arrested him under suspicion of thought crime, there might be some metaphors here, you know? The Limbu Si is standing in an all-white washed-out room, framed in a perspective that doesn't seem to fit his body proportions at all. Around him, splashes of color reflected in mirrors so broken that it's impossible to discern the shapes. Certainly seems to be alluding to a similar sense of alienation from surrounding reality. His ego is called Hayong, and I honestly couldn't find much on it. I've seen claims that it was one of Yi's aliases, but I could not find proof for it. Yi Sang was a pen name to begin with. It might be a reversal of how Yong Ha, one of the most common Korean names, is written, but the characters don't match. If there are any Korean speakers in the audience, please let me know what to make of this. Call me Ishmael. Ishmael is the first person narrator of Moby Dick or The Whale, written by Herman Melville in 1851, which tells the story of Captain Ahab's obsession with hunting down the white whale that bit his leg off on his ship's previous voyage. At first, I thought that Ahab would fit the shared theme of the Limbus cast better, that being, in one form or another, ego and either embracing it or disassociating from it. The captain's quest is positively insane and rooted in an obsession to take revenge on an animal that he hunted for profit to begin with, but 
then I thought about it. Who better to fit a theme of this association than a character that is part of the events of the story, but who is such a non-participant that nobody ever bothered to ask him for his real name? The name Ishmael in the Bible is associated with orphans, exiles and other social outcasts, people on the fringes of society. And yet, it's this one sailor that lives to tell the tale after the ship is sunk by the white whale once more. Her ego is called hers, and in the novel Ahab is told that before his death he will see two of these, one made from American wood and one not made by mortal hands. The latter is the white whale itself, as a body of the harpooner Fedala is entangled on top of it. The wooden one is the ship itself, carrying the corpses of all the crew other than Ishmael, who rises to the surface in a coffin that was on board of the ship. Wait, is that the motherfucking Jojo reference? I have not broken your heart, you have broken it, and in breaking it, you have broken mine. Coming in hot from the 1847 novel Wuthering Heights written by Emily Bront, Heathcliff is the epitome of spite. The story centers on two well-off families, Earnshaws and Lintons, and Heathcliff is an adopted son of the former house. His life is miserable as he is mistreated by almost everyone but Mr. Earnshaw and his daughter Catherine. The two grow close, but in the end she decides to just stay friends and marry Edgar Linton. So Heathcliff, like the healthy individual he is, marries Edgar's sister, horribly mistreats her, then, under threat of death, forces his son to marry Catherine and Edgar's daughter to become the owner of both estates. Oh yeah, and he digs up Catherine's corpse to look at her as she died at childbirth. At the end, with his revenge fulfilled and both estates in his name, Heathcliff just loses all will to live and wanders the home of Woodering Heights, staring blankly at walls, until one day he is found dead with heavy rain pouring over his corpse from an open window. His ego is named Revenge, which is pretty self-explanatory, really. And the character art drives the point of how much misery and death was caused by him because he couldn't marry a woman that was technically his sister. Por Alcanzar la Estrella Inalcanzable, to reach the unreachable star. First released in 1605, The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha is a novel written by Miguel de Cervantes. In it, the eponymous bored noble reads so many books on chivalric ideals that he decides to become a knight errant, slaying monsters and saving ladies in distress, along with his trusty squire Sancho. Only issue is, he lives in a day and age that has long abandoned these ideals, some might even say that they never existed outside of fiction to begin with. Don Quixote has been quite memetic for attacking windmills, saying that they are hill giants, but there's also things like proclaiming his love to a woman he never met, and trying to constantly be a hero by assaulting people minding their own business, like a procession of pilgrims. The man is so lost in the world of honorable knights and fair ladies, a genre which, I need to say, was spawned and extremely popular in Cervantes' times, that he completely misunderstands the much more complex and interesting world around him. Though he did free a bunch of galley slaves, so at least he did one thing right. However, modern interpretations of the story are much more understanding of Don Quixote, painting him as a man too idealistic for the world he lives in. Most famous modern edition is the Broadway musical Man of La Mancha, from which both the quote and the name of his ego come from. Sueno Imposible means impossible dream, which is the name of probably the most famous song of the entire show. The character art prominently features a merry-go-round, spinning around like a windmill and being just a child's play version of riding a horse. Also, I have to mention how one of my mutuals, Hysaf, mentioned how he's the only character in the cast that doesn't look like he would mug you for a pack of cigarettes. It's, it's kinda hilarious, honestly. May Tsong Kung Buzu Hao Shi Duomo all is good if not for one thing. The road to happiness is strewn with setbacks. Fun fact, that quote is two idioms put together and machine translation really doesn't like that, but I hope my translation of trying to fit the two together is possible. I tried to make it a bit more poetic to fit the theme. Dream of the Red Chamber, or Honglu Man, is one of the great Chinese works of literature, written down by Suao Xuechin, who was in the direct service of the Qing dynasty and first printed in 1791. It tells the story of a sentient stone left behind when the goddess Nua mended the heavens. It wishes to enjoy the pleasures of red dust, or the mundane world, and is reborn as a boy born with a piece of jade in his mouth. The novel's story spans across years and depicts the rise and decline of wealth and status, the lasting power of love 
and, according to many critics, bought this enlightenment of realizing how fleeting the material world is. The titular Red Chamber, or Hong Lu, is present in the protagonist's dream in one chapter, foreshadowing the fate of several characters. Look, I'll be honest, the translation of this book is almost 1000 pages long and I don't have that kind of lifespan. But I do have enough lifespan to watch the 30-something episodes TV series adaptation that won several awards that I learned of when writing the script. Just throwing this out there to anyone else that feels like an ingesting some culture after it was cut into bite-sized pieces by the chef. Their ego is called Taishu Huajing, which translates to illusory world or universe, which is in line with the dualist themes of real world being all just a set of illusions like in Demian and the disconnection someone enlightened would feel from the surroundings. Kaina de no eshi ni wa sojite miniku monono utsukushisa nadoto mosu kotowa wakaro hazuga gozaimasenu. Other painters are such mediocrities, they cannot appreciate the beauty of ugliness. Alluding to Hellscreen, a 1918 short story written by Ryunosuke Akutegawa, which centers around a famous painter Yoshihide, tasked by the local lord to paint a folding screen depicting the eight Buddhist hells. Yoshihide is not one to shy away from gruesome study for his work, often doing things like just sitting down next to a corpse laying by the road and sketching it in minute detail. He commits more and more questionable acts, like having an all attack his apprentice, in pursuit of perfectly painting torment and torture, which culminates in him requesting the Lord to burn down a carriage with a woman in it, burning alive, as the final piece of the screen. So of course, Yoshihide witnesses his daughter being consumed by flames, finishes his work and hangs himself. But the Limbus character is not named Yoshihide. She's named Ryoshu, which means Lord, and no matter what depravity the painter's obsession committed in the name of art, the one true despicable person in the story is the Lord who commissioned the whole thing. The entire story is framed as a servant telling the story, and despite heaping praise on their sire, it is painfully obvious that the feudal Lord is a piece of shit. He's generous! So he offered a favorite servant of his as human sacrifice for a temple. He's just, and that's why he instantly denied Yoshihide's plea to let his daughter stop working at the mansion, despite previously stating he can have anything for his previous work. He is honorable, and that's why he tried to rape the girl and had her burn alive when that didn't work out. The background art depicts the hell on earth in the form of the city's back streets, specifically the five fingers allude to the powerful syndicates known as, well, fingers. Her ego is a set of three yojijikugo, Japanese four-character idioms. They are as follow. Mugamuchu, selfless focus. Abikyokai, pandemonium, agonized screams. Shiri Metsuretsu, incoherent, illogical, not making sense. So in full, it can be translated as something like senseless, selfless focus on tortured screams, I think. Aujourd'hui... Mama o mort, o pepetier je ne sais pas. Mother died today, or maybe it was yesterday, I don't know. The protagonist of 1942 novella The Stranger, penned by Albert Camus, Marceau is a man seemingly indifferent to everything. He attends his mother's funeral, but does not weep or show other signs of grief, gets into a sexual relationship just the day after, speaks his mind without a care for other person's feelings and, at the end of the first part of the story, shoots an Arab man in cold blood with seemingly no reason. His internal narration focuses not on the victim or any turmoil caused by his death, but on how bothered Mersault is by the heat and sunlight. His ego is called Sun in French, which is the only explanation novel Mersault has for the murder. The sun was in his eyes, and that's why he shot the Arab. Sun not as something to be praised and prayed to, a benevolent force of light and warmth, but an irritating eyesore. Merceau is so disconnected from the world around him that he does not share the common, seemingly universal cultural associations. And Limbus Merceau is so disconnected from the world that there seems to not be a speck of color in his entire character art. It's all the same to him. My name is Otis. Otis is the Greek word for nobody, most famously used as a pseudonym by Odysseus in the Odyssey, a collection of poems written by Homer circa 8th century BCE. In the Odyssey, when meeting the Cyclops, Odysseus claims that his name is Otis, or nobody. 
When the hero strikes the monster in its one eye, the giant cries, nobody is trying to kill me, and so nothing comes to its rescue, despite it being the son of Poseidon. The ego is the same word but written in Greek alphabet. In general, the character seems peculiar. The ego name is not seen anywhere on the weapon, unlike on the other art. The name repeats itself. The quote is in English rather than Greek. It's as if Otis was a blank slate, devoid of identity, truly a no one. The character art might allude to Trojan War, but that's all I have. On a side note, the Latin equivalent of Otis is Nemo, so I hope that the cane office plays some role here. As ihr der Mensch so lang er strept, man errs as long as he strives. Faust is a legendary character, but his most famous rendition is that from the stage play of the same name by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, first published in 1808. The titular scholar is bored of the limits of human knowledge and is approached by a demon called Mephistopheles, offering him magical powers and the ability to do anything he wants for the price of his soul. The catch being that if Faust is ever pleased to the point where he wished that the moment would never pass, he would die instantly. Side note, but I always love the quote from Mephistopheles claiming that he is part of that force that always wills the evil and always produces the good, explicitly stating that he is up to no good, but luring Faust in, claiming the opposite of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. That's what we call a false equivalence, kids. The ego is called Walpurgisnacht, which is the night of Saint Walpurgis. The last night of April, which in Germany is often associated with witches meeting on the Brocken Mountain and consorting with the devil. As most Saints X Day, it is believed to be a pagan holiday retrofitted into Christian canon by the church. In the play, Faust visits the Brocken on Walpurgisnacht, where Mephistopheles tries to get him late so that he stops thinking about Gretchen, a young woman that he seduced and impregnated when turned into a young man by magic. And that's all folks, 12 characters, 12 accounts of egoism or lack of self, hopefully 12 interesting spins on the idea in Limbus once it comes out. Shame we didn't get any Polish representation, yeah, next time, it's always the next time. Actually, quick addendum, as a new character was revealed just as I was editing the audio, so I'm doing this bit unscripted, Dante, most famously the protagonist of the May Cry. Second most famously, Dante Alighieri uh, wrote the Divine Comedy, which was finished in 1320. It's a story about his journey throughout hell, then purgatory and heaven to find his dead love, with the companionship of uh, his sent by Virgilius. It's very much a fanfic, so never let anyone tell you that you're a subpar writer because you write fanfics, but it's very important for Italian poetry in general. Interestingly, the ego is named Durante, which was Dante's real name, so there is an implication that rather than ego, this might be, you know, true name, like in Demon Mythos, where someone's true name gives them power over you, which is interesting when it repeats with Otis, but, you know, again, this is just speculation based on the fact that we got one art that I didn't expect, so, you know, grain of salt. This video was made thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters, now visible on the screen. Please consider Consider joining their association if you like what I'm doing, or just save my ego by sharing the video and interacting with it. Next video is already written and recorded, so stay tuned. See you in two weeks or so.